Welcome to the Probate Realtor Show, your one source for selling and buying real estate through trust and probate. Hear directly from the best attorneys and trusted advisors on how executors and administrators navigate the probate process in and out of court. Being a personal representative or successor trustee can be a daunting task, and often beneficiaries don't have a clear plan. Let us help you make the right decision for your clients, your family, and your legacy. And now, here's your host, the probate realtor himself, Matias Baker Mazzucci. Welcome, everybody, to the show. Today, we are talking to Nathan B. Hoffman. Nathan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's so good to have you. Nathan is a probate and trust litigator with an extreme wealth of knowledge. So I can't wait for him to share his knowledge with with our audience. Nathan, the very first question that I'm going to ask you is, what is an independent review? So um, a number of years ago, um, around 2010 or so, the California legislature passed uh, some new legislation in the probate code that provided for an independent review of any kind of donative transfer. Some people think it's only a will or a trust. That's not accurate. It's any kind of a donative transfer. And it's to prohibitive groups of people. For example, the most significant or the most common are caregivers. So if someone wants to make a donative transfer over the statutory limit, then they need to go through an independent review with a lawyer. Mm -hmm. who meets with that person privately uh, and has reviewed, obviously, the documents, whether they're estate planning documents or whatever they might be. And the purpose of that meeting is to have a private meeting with that person to determine whether or not uh, they are making this gift of their own free will Mm -hmm. or whether they are being in some manner or way unduly or improperly influenced by the caregiver, by a lawyer, by a fiduciary. Uh, someone in the prohibitive capacity. After the legislation was put in place and as time progressed, many estate planning lawyers decided that it would be appropriate to recommend to their clients that they do independent reviews, even if they're not statutory. That is, there's not, it doesn't involve one of these prohibitive classes of people. And the reason again is to provide another layer of protection for an estate plan so that someone who is independent could come in if that estate plan were challenged. And we do a lot of those now. That, that, that's uh, very common. So we have two w- reasons of how somebody arrives at, at, at an independent review. One is statutory. So if somebody's given a gift, you mentioned caregivers. Can you give me an example of what other people are in this, cath- in, in this category that puts them into the prohibitive? Fiduciaries, mm-hmm. lawyers, accountants, um, other it. people who have those kinds of responsibilities. It's actually identified in the code section very directly as to when it's mandatory and when it has to happen. And as I said, it's kind of morphed now into a circumstance of whenever the estate planner has a concern that somebody might be unduly or improperly influencing Mm -hmm. their client, they will contact me or uh, another provider to do an independent review. And how does the how, what's involved in the process? Essentially, you know, I'm, I'm drafting or updating my estate plans, my trust, my my will, uh, and medical directive, and all those things. Does the attorney come to you and say, Nathan, here is what I have. This is my client's contact info. Get in touch with them and see what you can do and, and do your thing. Yes, yeah, summarily, yes. It's almost ninety nine percent of the time a contact through the drafting council, mm-hmm. that council will have told their client, hey, look, I really want you or you need to go through an independent review. Mm-hmm. Uh, m- most quality estate planners have more than one person that they work with to do independent reviews. Right. They'll give the client a list. Sometimes the client will contact me directly. More often, it's the lawyer who's drafted the estate plan will contact me and say, I have a client who needs an independent review. Are you available? Do you have any conflicts with this person? Because obviously we have to do conflicts checks to make sure sure that none of the parties uh, would create a conflict. Once that happens, I typically send out an introductory email. This is what we're going to do. Uh, I need copies of all the estate planning documents to review. We prepare an engagement letter. Um, Sometimes if we're representing both a husband and a wife, a waiver of potential conflicts is involved. Um, There's payment, obviously, for the services. 
And then we arrange the independent review. And before the review, I will have reviewed all of the estate planning documents looking for what the referring lawyer has identified as a possible issue, but also doing my own independent analysis to make sure that I cover other matters that might be the subject of the independent review. Once that's all done, we set it up. These days, they're done either in person or by Zoom, depending on the availability of the clients, how far away they are, and, and mm -hmm. healthy and kinds of other matters. Uh, and those meetings last an hour or more, depending on the complexity of the issues uh, and the client. And also, I tend to give them a lot of history and other information that's not directly related mm -hmm. to an independent review. So they're educated about right. why we're doing it and they understand it. Uh, so it takes a little bit longer than it might just to do a, you know, pure independent review. That makes sense. Now, let me ask you this. Um, what are some of the, I know that obviously by a statutory independent review, we know what the red flags are. What are some of the red flags that may be identified when it's, when an independent review is not required by code, but an estate planning attorney should say, look, we got to get an independent review here. The most <laughs> common involves, um, it, it, look, when you have a two-parent family with two children and mom and dad are leaving all of their uh, assets to each other first and then to their children equally, mm -hmm. and everybody knows everything and there are no issues, no independent reviews required. It's just, right. It is just what it is. But we have many circumstances where that's not going to happen. So right. there's going to be an unequal distribution to children. You're anticipating that someone is going to consider challenging the estate plan, yes. whether it's the distribution of assets, whether it's the appointment of trustees, uh, uh, successor trustees, whether it's the appointment of various agents mm -hmm. uh, to, that, that might be involved, including healthcare agents, all, all of these matters where there is a potential that someone in the family is going to challenge it. It also becomes really common for estate planners to recommend it in the successor families. And what I mean by that is, you know, family number one is mom and dad and two kids. There's a divorce, somebody remarries. There are mm -hmm. now children from marriage number two or three or four. Yes. And there are unequal distributions or mom and dad decide to disinherit right. one or more of their beneficiaries. Um, so all of those are the kinds of things that are red flags for estate planners. And estate planners should know that if they don't recommend an independent review when it's required, mm -hmm. there's the potential that they could be sued for malpractice. In fact, there's one case where a personal injury lawyer did a will for someone uh, and never recommended the independent review because the beneficiary was a caregiver, so it was statutory. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, there was a demur to a, a, a complaint filed by the caregiver who couldn't recover mm -hmm. that was overruled by the Court of Appeal and said, this is a circumstance where this beneficiary, potential beneficiary, could sue a lawyer who wasn't a client of that lawyer. Now, we don't know what happened because... You know, we never saw the underlying ultimate conclusion, but it's just a warning. Lawyers need to understand these potential risks. That makes total sense. I, I talk to a lot of probate litigators, and one of the things that sometimes comes up is disinheritance. You know, my son is a junkie, or I had, he's in jail. I had to support him all his life. My other son is amazing, so I'm going to leave everything to my um, to this one particular uh, next of kin, et cetera, et cetera. And do you feel? that an independent review, because I, I know that disinheritance cases get challenged a lot. So do you feel that an independent review provides an extra layer of, or, or, is it bulletproof in this case or is it not? <clears throat> not bulletproof because it's okay. not statutory, but I'll tell you what a number of the retired judges from the probate bench and I have talked about. If the independent review is done properly by somebody who knows what they're doing, Mm -hmm. As one of the judges replied, a gold standard review. Yes. Then when the judge hears from that lawyer, because that lawyer is going to, that lawyer who did the independent review is mm -hmm. going to testify, I am sure. So lawyers like me, we keep notes, we keep our files, 
Right. I'm not going to remember what I did five years ago, but if I look back at my file and my notes, I'll be able to refresh my memory. If I make a good impression on the trial judge, from speaking with the judges, the answer is yes. It'll be very supportive of construing the trust in the way in which it was drafted uh, and defeating the challenge. If it's done by somebody who doesn't know what they're doing and spends five minutes with somebody and just signs a document, probably not worth the paper it's written on. Got it. Got it. That makes total sense. Now, one of the things that I have uh, encountered is that sometimes in order to, like you said, a lot of lawyers are not even familiar with the independent review process, even, even estate planners. So sometimes they recommend, look, this inheritance is going to be challenged. You're going to lose. Just pay them off. Say you're going to leave them a certain amount of money and, and this and that. Do you feel, even if somebody maybe doesn't want to do that, it's like, you know, I don't want to do it, but the attorney said, look, he's going to be challenged. Give him 20 grand. He's not going to bother. You know, he's not going to bother your other siblings. Do you feel that it's an effective way to still live something to that sibling so it's not completely disinherit? Or with an independent review, you're like, you know what? You don't even have to worry about that. It's never you don't have to worry about it because mm -hmm. that kind of an independent review is not statutory, right? Right. It, you have to know the family and you have to know the people. Obviously, the more money you leave the to be disinherited person, the right. less likely they are to challenge. Right. On the other hand, if you give them money, you may in, help them challenge your trust. So uh, frankly, I leave that up to the estate planners. They're the geniuses it. that are creating the plans. They come up with it. You know, my role is either to provide the independent review if the estate planner and the client want that to happen, or mm -hmm. if I don't have a conflict to be available to represent the successor trustee when the trustor passes away and that disinherited child sues his brother or sister. <laughs> yeah. So I'm available either way. <laughs> Good. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Now, let me ask you something um, about, you know, I think you've already answered, like, when can an independent review fail and be useless? It's essentially the competence of the person that is doing the review. Sure. I mean, like anything, you're talking about in life, everything that we do in the courtroom is subject to review by the judge who's sitting in the probate court. And, you know, right. we don't have juries in probate court. So you have a judge. I am sure there are judges who are particularly uh, familiar and interested and reliant on independent reviews. And then there are going to be new judges that are coming new into the system, for example, who may not have a lot of knowledge on the issue. So on any particular case, any given day, you really never know what's going to happen in the courtroom. But more often than not, and I can tell you from speaking with most of the members of the Los Angeles County Probate Court, and the Ventura County Probate Court, they look at the independent review as another item of evidence. Mm -hmm. And so if the evidence is supportive, it helps them make a decision. If they don't believe the independent reviewer, they don't think that independent reviewer did a good job, they only spent five minutes on it, you know, and it's a, then it probably is a, a useless document. So again, I think it's the quality uh, and experience of that independent reviewer that's going to carry the day. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you for, for, elabor for elaborating. And, and on also, that. I do a lot of mediations because I'm also a, a certified mediator. Okay. And I can tell you in the mediation circumstances, given what I know, I will obviously understand what an independent review is. And we deal with a lot of these disinherited cases in probate and trust matters. Got it. That makes sense. Now, let me ask you a question. When you look at an estate plan, because obviously you have to look at it and, and hopefully the referring attorney is competent, but when that is not the case, do you find sometimes in the estate plan your need to go back to the attorney and say, look, you know, this violates the probate code or this is not like that. I mean, you know, I'm not saying, hopefully the majority of the attorneys out there are competent, but, or somebody that has done it online, for instance, there's people who do estate plan online, right? Is there something that you say, do you ever go back and say, look, you got to modify the estate plan. This is not just about doing an independent review. This is about, you know, we got to correct something. Well, first of all, I have been fortunate never to have reviewed an online estate plan for an independent <laughs> review. So I, I can't answer that directly, but I will answer it indirectly. I have had conversations with estate planners where I've said, I read paragraph 16 of your trust. And frankly, I'm confused by it. So you might okay. want to take a look at it. I don't, it's not my role to be 
someone who is criticizing the work product of another professional. Of course. So I do it in a different way. I will let them know if I have a problem understanding it. Maybe they and their client might have a problem or it might create a problem later. And then I kind of let them decide how they want to change it if they oh. do. Very nice. Try to be as professional there as I can. <laughs> no, ta being tactful is extremely important. It's, but you know, it's, you don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I love, I love it how you present it. It's like, look, I have a difficult time understanding this paragraph. Maybe you know, there's something that you know we can we can be a little bit clearer. Or something. I, I have done that on a few occasions, and mm -hmm. uh, usually I get back an amended document. Um, because remember, I review all of these in advance. So I have a, an upcoming independent review on the 25th. Uh -huh. This morning, I was reviewing two separate trusts that are involved. So right. I'm looking at it today. I'm marking it up. I'm yellow marking it for mm -hmm. my review for stuff that I need to talk about. If something came up, I would then contact that lawyer because I want to have it all resolved before the 25th or they need to change the date on it if they're going to make some changes. Because I want to review the final document that's going to be the subject of the trust that's going to be signed. Perfect. That makes that makes total sense. Let's let me ask you a little bit about, you know, let's move slightly about, you know, undue influence and and, and elder abuse, which I understand you're also a champion of of, you know, um, fighting for those who unfortunately get taken advantage of. And in our business, in real estate, I see it a lot, people who have been talked into selling homes to their cousin for, you know, half of what they're worth on the market. And unfortunately, you know, like, thank God, I, I've in more than one occasion, I've gone to court, even though it was not my listing, to tell the judge that the property was never advertised, and they were just trying to do a confirmation and the agent never put the property. Anyway, all of those things we've seen. So my question to you is that sometimes you get brought in to protect people who have been taken advantage of. And what in your experience, what is, you know, how do you proceed in something like that, you know, when, when somebody's been taken advantage of? Well, unfortunately, it is unusual for me to be called before the damage is done. Mm -hmm. Normally, I get a call saying, hey, my aunt, my grandmother, or a, a financial expert will call me and say, my client went through this transaction and it stinks and it, right. you know, it's bad. Or they, they, or sometimes I'll get a call from the elder directly. So, in California, we're lucky. We, we have a very extensive set of uh, financial, both injury, personal, as well as financial elder abuse statutes that provide a great deal of protection for elders who have been abused by their children, by their caregivers, by their lawyers, by their real estate agents, whoever right. it might be. Uh, and it provides for the recovery of, of two and three times damages, attorney's fees, uh, and my experience is that when I have filed those matters, mm -hmm. the potential recovery of double treble damages and attorney's fees by the elder and only the elder uh, really moves those matters to be resolved quickly. Um, so you're in mediation. And one of the things the mediator will say to the alleged abuser is, you realize that if Mr. Hoffman and his client prevail, they're not going to get back simply the $100,000 that you stole. They're going to get two or 300000 plus all of Mr. Hoffman's billings and attorney's fees are going to be added on top of that. And if you win, by the way, because you think you're so smart, you're not going to get any of that back. All you're going to get is a defense judgment, and you'll get some costs maybe. That usually empowers the elder uh, and, and moves matters to resolution. I've never had a case that didn't resolve Oh, by the way, wow. in the elder abuse area, that's 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 good to know. Let me let, let's let's talk about you. Let's talk about your journey. I mean, your knowledge is fantastic, but I want to know how did you know when you were a child? Did you dream of becoming a? <laughs> no, quite the opposite. Up until I was a second semester senior, I intended to go to dental school. I was accepted to dental school. Okay. And as a second semester senior, I took a class called histology. I hated it. I hated the people. I came home to my fiance, now wife, and said, change in plans, honey. I'm not going to uh, dental school. And she said, all right, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. So the first <laughs> thing I did was I got a real estate license because there was oh, nothing there you go. for me to do. Yeah. And, I, and I, I did really well for a, a few months in real estate and decided that what I was going to do was go to law school and become a real estate developer. So I would have a broker's license and a law degree, and I could 
I could do well. Well, I got into law school and I really enjoyed law school and I fell in love with the litigation part of the practice, which is uh -huh. obviously only one part of the legal world. And I, I graduated and started practicing law in 1979. I was with a firm for a couple of years, left that firm with a couple of partners from that firm. We started our own firm in Century City where I stayed until 1999. And mm -hmm. at the end of 1999, I left and went out on my own. And in the early 2000s, I was introduced by a friend to probate and trust work. Now been doing that exclusively. Uh, and I'll continue to do that until I decide to retire. But I'm doing a lot more mediations and independent reviews and a little bit less on the litigation side than I used to. Very nice, very nice. So so you uh, essentially, now you've been doing this for almost 20 years or 20 no years. More. Oh, you, this area, yeah. Yeah, yes. the, specific, the specific niche of the, yeah. Very, very nice, great. 15, yeah, 15 to 20, probably 15, yeah. Got it, got it, very, very nice. And, and you I'll enjoy you, my, it? My, my family always says to me, I, I don't understand. You know, you said when you were in law school that you had no interest in family law, and now you're doing family law after death. And they said, <laughs> yeah, I know, but it, it just, it happened and I really enjoyed it. And I like the collegiality of most of the lawyers in this area. It's a small group. The probate judges are almost always uh, very highly qualified people. Uh, and it's a much more collegial group than being in the general civil practice. From my experience. I, I, you know, I love hearing you say that because I've actually heard it from quite a few probate litigators that how much they they love and how much, you know, our, our court, you know, Stanley Mosque is, you know, like everybody kind of knows each other and all of that. And, and that's that's saying something about a system. that I, I, I do is. regularly see the same group of people quite often. Yes, yes. I one day that. we're on the same side and the next day we're on opposite sides. But it's OK, because when you have a really good lawyer, on the opposite side, it's better for the client. You're going to get things resolved more quickly and properly than if you have somebody who just doesn't know what they're doing. Which, yeah. which actually br brings me brings me to a quote of yours that I've read, which which I, I really liked. When to argue and when not to argue, right? <laughs> Knowing yeah. when to argue and when not to argue. So I'm asking you, how important is that for a professional? Well, I'll just tell you what the judges have said to me. You yeah. know, there are, there are times when the judge has made up his or her mind, and it's not hard to know when that time is if you've been in a courtroom long enough to mm -hmm. know when the judge has already made up their mind. Uh, and at that point, arguing isn't going to help you anymore. Right. The other thing is, and, and young lawyers need to learn this all the time, when you're winning, be quiet. <laughs> You don't need to say anymore if the judge is already ready to rule in your favor. Right, Only right. if the judge wants more information. Otherwise, relax and accept the win. Very nice. Very nice. Okay, let's wrap things up with a little game that I like to do, and I want you to indulge me. I have I have a list of random questions numbered okay. from, from 1 to 30. And if you pick a number from 1 to 30, uh, I 26. will ask you that question. 26. All right. 26. I was married on the 26th. Our oldest son was born on the 26th. There's a whole bunch of 26s in my life. So that's the number. Okay, beautiful. What is life's biggest mystery to you? Why I have such a lovely, loving family and other people have difficulties with their families. I am blessed to have a wife that I've been married to since 1976, who I adore. I have three beautiful children, three beautiful grandchildren, and I feel so lucky and i see so many families where that just isn't true and i don't know why i'm so lucky but i think it's my mom and dad that's wonderful very very nice thank you so much we're going to end on a very nice note now before i let you go uh, nathan I, I you know people will be listening to this episode but some people um people that are watching your contact information are going to be in the show notes but for if anybody needs to get a hold of you what is the best way to get a hold of you Email is always the best way because okay. even if I'm not in the office, I see my email typically. So I would recommend to somebody if they need to get a hold of me, use my email. Okay. Um, if they call my office, they will leave a message if I'm unavailable and I will get that message as well. I have a system that actually sends me those uh, messages even if I'm out of the office. Okay, fantastic. It's been such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thank You're you for inviting me.
Absolutely. It's, it's, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, everybody who's, who have joined this episode. We will see you on the next episode. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.